Well, good morning, afternoon, or evening, really, uh, whenever and from wherever you are joining us today, uh, you are welcome. Welcome to our worship on Trinity Sunday. Uh, if this is your first time to worship with us, then you are especially welcome. Now, at this time, it's good to remember that although we are apart, we are not alone. And later today, we look forward to hearing from Margaret and Robert Archer, who will be leading us in our prayers and reading the Bible for us. But as we begin, let us join our voices together in our first hymn. As we gather together in our homes to worship God today, uh, let us begin by confessing our sins to Him and receiving from Him the forgiveness that we so desperately need. We have too often exchanged the worship of the living God uh, for idols of our own imagining. And as we gather to offer our praises to the holy and undivided Trinity and to worship Him in spirit and in truth, let us call to mind our sins. Father, you come to meet us when we return to you. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, you died on the cross for our sins. Christ, have mercy. Spirit, you give us life and peace. Lord, have mercy. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. We call it for Trinity Sunday. Holy God, faithful and unchanging, enlarge our minds with the knowledge of your truth and draw us more deeply into the mystery of your love, that we may truly worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, as we turn now to God's word, uh, Margaret will be reading the Bible for us. The first lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. No confidence in the flesh. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil those mutilators of the flesh. 
For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is taken from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, beginning at the 16th verse. The Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your written word, I ask that you open our hearts to your living word, your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I wonder when you first came to know Jesus Christ. I know for me, I grew up in a Christian home every Sunday going to church, to Sunday school, uh, my mom and my dad sharing about Jesus with me. But it wasn't actually until my gap year, until that year uh, just out of high school, when I came to know Jesus Christ personally uh, by faith. I still remember the day my friend came home. He had received a, a Gideon's New Testament and read through the Gospel of John. And he came up to me and said, Josh, do you know anything about this Jesus person? Well, having been raised in a Christian home, I said, yes, I actually know quite a bit about Jesus. Why do you ask? Well, I've, you know, I've read the Gospel of John, and I think I believe in him. Well, I said, I don't think it's something you can think. It's something you either do or don't do. Do you believe in Jesus? Uh, yes, he said, I, I, I do. Uh, well, I, I went on to say, well, it's not, you know, if you're going to make that decision, it's a whole life decision. And if you're going to do it, then I'm going to do it. And we, um, you know, at the time, I was a little bit wayward. And so we, uh, we took all of our, our paraphernalia and threw it out uh, in the rubbish bin, uh, all the junk that we had. Um, yeah. The only thing we were actually left with was this carpet, uh, this little rug that had the sacred heart of Jesus on it, which we hung on our wall. And that's literally the, left, the only thing that we had left in our house. And it was really from that point on that I can say that I came to know Jesus Christ uh, personally. 
And Paul himself says in our reading in verse 10 that I want to know Christ. And so I wonder, uh, when was it that you came to know Jesus Christ personally? For many of us, it wasn't really a point in time, but maybe a process over time. Actually, more likely, it's probably a bit of both. And regardless, can you say today, I know Jesus Christ? In our Bible reading, Paul shares with us his story of coming to know Christ, the phrase that he used, as we've seen in verse 10, but also here in verse 8, where it says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Now, Paul's story was prompted by actually a problem in Philippi, which he describes in verses 1 to 4. It's a story which recalls really a radical change in Paul, away from his inherited privilege and personal success, described in verses 5 and 6, towards faith in Christ, as we see in verses 7 to 11. The first, what was going on in Philippi to prompt such a personal testimony from Paul? Well, There was a group there claiming that they alone were the people of God, were God's people. And if you wanted to have fellowship with God, then you had to join them. You had to go through their initiation and follow their customs. Now, the sarcastic language which Paul uses to parody this group in verses 2 and 3 identifies them for us, whom we've come to call the Judaizers. Now, Who were they? Well, they were a group of Christian, maybe, maybe not, Jews who were insisting that Gentile converts had to become Jewish proselytes. Now, ironically, Paul here applies to this group terms that they themselves would have only used for outsiders. He calls them dogs, evildoers, and mutilators. Uh, Play on words, uh, on the word circumcision. But behind the sarcasm, I mean, you can look at this and say, ooh, Paul, goodness. But behind the sarcasm is something really important. Paul is denouncing, really. He's warning the Philippians against it, and he is utterly denouncing the attitude that claims exclusive rights to fellowship with God. It's an attitude which uh, far too often, I should say, poisons our own relationships. Not only those of... um, or those with, rather, uh, other denominations, but with each other. You know what we need? We need a band. No, 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 no. We need a choir. No, we need some, some rousing anthems. No, 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 no. We need hymns. No, you know what we really need? We need blazers. No, no, no. We need robes. That's what we really need. I joke. But how easy is it to suppose that God shares our own prejudices and beliefs? How easy is it to try and keep God for ourselves? To try and to imagine that we are in some way, somehow superior to our brothers and sisters. And it is this attitude which Paul bitterly attacks here. And warns the Philippians about. Not least because it was an attitude which he himself once shared. Verses 5 and 6. Really, we see Paul's inherited privilege and personal success. And really, in human terms, Paul had every reason to feel superior, to be confident. For Paul himself had been, you know, christened as an infant and confirmed as a young man. Just a minute, someone's trying to get into the church. <laughs> Amazing. It was, actually, uh, it was actually Mike coming to do some recording himself. Fantastic. Right, where were we? Let's start back again with verse, verse 5 there. Yeah. In human terms, Paul had every reason to feel superior, to feel more confident than others in a relationship with God. For he himself had been christened as an infant and confirmed as a young... Wait, 
No, that's not right. Sorry. Verse 5, not christened, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. And in addition to these inherited privileges, Paul had excelled, utterly excelled in everything Jewish. He played in the band. Oh, wait, no. That's wrong. Sorry. Uh, verse 5 again. In regards to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, and as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Faultless. Paul had the best possible religious credentials. And the conviction that what was his by birth and upbringing was worthless compared to what was his by faith in Christ. Faith. You know, faith is interesting. It means both an acceptance and a renunciation. I would like to think of faith in very positive terms as, as simply acceptance or belief or trust. But it also means to renounce other things. You see, before Paul could accept Christ, he had to renounce those things on which, as a Jew, he had personally relied upon, boasted in, was proud of, would work, had worked so hard before. It's just like the rich young ruler who had to renounce his wealth in order to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And to explain this radical change, Paul here uses an image of a profit and loss account. He says in verse 7, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. In other words, what he, what he once regarded as assets or as an asset, he now writes off as a loss for Christ's sake. Why? How? I mean, how could he do that? How could he just throw away his background like that? Well, the simple answer is because of the overwhelming value of what is now on offer in Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse 8, What is more, I consider everything a loss, a write-off, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, the word there is actually excrement. It's a bit more crass than garbage or rubbish. But I may get, that I may gain Christ, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. From his initiation rites and customs. But that which is through faith in Christ. You know, it's all too easy for us to cling to what uh, we regard as our own righteousness, to those things that we're proud of, to our background, to our upbringing, to our own cultural codes and moral standards. And like the Judaizers and Paul before them, we can assume that our own upbringing, however religious or irreligious it may have been, or routines deserve some sort of special consideration from God. You know, our christening, our confirmation, our attendance, although not particularly this time, although maybe you're watching of, of the uh, service, or our good works, or our moral standards, our reputation. But if we come to put our trust in God, we must also abandon all such props and pretenses. Because it is so possible to be concerned with what is right that we miss the one who is right. Jesus Christ. And so at this time, when really all pretexts have been stripped away, to be honest. Let me ask again. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know him personally? 
and is your aim to know him more. Well, let us respond with the words of the creed, the Apostles' Creed this morning. Well, or afternoon or evening, whatever. Together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Robert will now lead us in our prayers. Let us pray. Jesus said, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Heavenly Father, we praise you for giving your gift of the Holy Spirit to early Christians, making Jesus real to them, teaching them the truth and giving them the power to witness boldly. As we pray for ourselves, we ask you to fill each one of us with your Holy Spirit. Open our minds to understand your truths and open our hearts to accept your truth in faith. Teach us to surrender our ideas, our limitations, preferences and ambitions and in doing so to put our trust and hope in you alone. So, like Paul, we can say Everything else is worthless when compared with knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for the situation in America brought about by the death of George Floyd. As we ask you to comfort his family and friends, we pray too for all who feel marginalised and we bring before you the Black Lives Matter movement. May your spirit bring unity and peace to hurting communities. We pray too for all refugee seekers, and we ask you to bless those who have recently sought refuge here in Wirral. Wherever there is friction and hatred caused by racial unrest and economic inequalities, we ask you to raise up leaders blessed with the gifts, to diffuse tensions and promote fairness for all. Heavenly Father, deepen the understanding of all people, that barriers which divide may be removed and peace restored. For you love all you have made, and we are all made in your image. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As life has changed over the past months, we pray for all whose lives have been altered through illness or bereavement, and we ask you, Heavenly Father, to heal and comfort them. We remember too the acts of kindness and the changes in the environment which have blessed us. In the book of Zechariah we read, Not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will move in this land and influence our leaders. We pray for Boris Johnson, our government, and all making decisions in this time of uncertainty. We pray for our country as each day new guidelines are broadcast to open up our schools, our businesses, and our way of life. Give wisdom and compassion to all in authority that the policies produced might be for the common good and your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we continue to ask for your protection on all who work in the National Health Service, care homes and the community. We pray for their health and strength in the workplace and ask you to bless all those in their care. We bring to you all who work in education and we ask your blessing on young people and children, teaching and support staff and the authorities that govern them all. Safeguard the many vulnerable pupils and those with special needs and anxieties. Father, give the wisdom of Solomon to those making difficult decisions and enable them to select the right choices. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for your church here on earth. We bless you for the opportunities we have had to worship you through today's technology. As you told your disciples to catch their fish by casting their nets on the other side of the boat all those years ago, we praise you that so many have been drawn to you again online. Holy Spirit, open the eyes and the ears of all who seek Jesus and speak to their hearts. We pray too for those who have asked for our prayers in our parish at this time. In the name of Jesus we ask for healing for those who are sick and comfort for all who mourn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us give praise to the Father who by his grace has made his, us his children, to the Son who by his death and resurrection has brought us new life, to the Spirit who dwells in our hearts and strengthens us for service, to the Holy and Blessed Trinity be praise and glory for ever and ever. Amen. As we now move from God's Word to the Lord's table, if you'd like to, you can get a, a, some wine and some bread at home to partake in a spiritual communion. We may not be able to all partake in the same place, but we can at the same time. Amen. Well, as we come now to the Lord's table, uh, let's remember the peace that we have with God. Peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father. Peace from His Son, Jesus Christ, who is our peace. Peace from the Holy Spirit, the life giver. The peace of the triune God be always with you. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. For in your love you made us for yourself. And when we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, but came, sorry, in Christ you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night that he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. For his blood is shed for all. 
So as, as we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. And so with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna. Savior taught us, and so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. and Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Almighty and eternal God, you have revealed yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and live and reign in the perfect unity of love. Hold us firm in this faith that we may know you in all your ways, and evermore rejoice in your eternal glory, who are three persons yet one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, let us say it together. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your disciples, I am with you always. Be with me today as I offer myself to you. Hear my prayers for others and for myself, and keep me in your care. Amen. Well, let us now sing our final.
Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us uh, for our worship today on Trinity Sunday as we celebrate our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And thank you, Margaret and Robert, for uh, your reading and your prayers. It's absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Let's pray. Oh, the Father who first loved us and made us accepted in the beloved Son, bless you. Amen. God, the Son who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, bless you. Amen. God, the Holy Spirit who sheds abroad the love of God in our hearts, bless you. Amen. The blessing of the one true God, to whom be all love and all glory for time and for eternity, come down upon you. And remain with you always. Amen. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ.